Salis. Uh, I'm Dominique Marshall. I'm a historian and a member of the Institute of Practical Studies. If some of you are not familiar with this group and you would like to be on the list of uh, the Institute, please come and see me at the end and I'll take your email address. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, uh, let me tell you that our last um, uh, uh, our last presentation of the year is on April the 1st, uh, in a month from now, uh, at, at the same place, same time, and Karen Myatt, who is a candidate uh, in, for the field in anthropology, uh, will be here to speak about informal Islamic movements in Morocco and report from his uh, later, latest uh, travels over there. Um, and before I introduce uh, Joan, maybe uh, Blair, you have a few events to announce? Sure, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Dominique. Um, next Thursday, we're uh, co-organizing a, a day-long conference with the African diplomats in town on Agenda 2063, which is the African Union's agenda. They're kind of visioning exercise about what Africa should look like in 50 years. We're having a critical discussion with, of that. Um, going to be in the River Building in the, the second floor in the conference room from 9 to 9 to 5. Uh, and then two weeks from today, I'm glad that our visiting scholar from Bordeaux, France, uh, Jean-Nicolas uh, Bach will be talking about his research on Ethiopia and looking at the e upcoming Ethiopian election, if I recall correctly. <laughs> uh, same time, uh, same place in this room from 1 to 2.30, uh, uh, which, is, which is great. Uh, so those are the uh, immediate events I can think of. Okay. So every year we try to invite uh, uh, graduate students, scholars from any disciplines, scholars from the University of Ottawa, and people who work with NGOs. And this time, uh, Joanne Lebev, our uh, speaker, is the NGO person, and she is also a partner of two people here, uh, Doris Puss, who is in legal studies, and Blair, who's just spoken, who is in anthropology. Joanne herself is a... Um, trained uh, in Toronto, York, and Oxford University uh, in international development and anthropology and also refugee studies. And uh, when she finds, uh, I don't know where, the time to carry on going, she's finishing a PhD at York in anthropology. She is now working and she's been for the last few years with Partnership Africa Canada. Um, an organization who is um, more than 30 years old and has this vast uh, name, Partnership Africa Canada, because as Ron was telling me at lunchtime, it used to be the main or, um, NGO to distribute uh, CEDA money to uh, people working in Africa Canada, but now they have specialized uh, in, uh, uh, and they are internationally renowned for that in uh, some aspects of uh, work in Africa namely uh, uh, mineral exploitation, a uh, recently uh, taxation justice, and also gender violence. Uh, Joanne has been part before that of many NGOs, uh, CARE Canada, Amnesty International, um, Peace, what's the name of it? Peace Build. Peace Build, uh, as well, and uh, brought all that experience to being now one of the five members of that office partners with uh, tons of people internationally and in Africa. And today she's going to report on her work on conflict minerals, gender and insecurity in Africa, Great Lakes region, the limitations of the sexual violence paradigm. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I wrote my first rule of PowerPoint presentations is that I have too much text in my PowerPoints, uh, but I'll try to uh, summarize and, and move quickly enough. I think I have, is about 25 minutes or so, half hour? Well, we're down until 2.30, okay. so 2.25. So okay. whatever you take, you can take 45, 45, or if you take more or less. All right, so if you want me to stop, I, I will stop. <laughs> All right, so I just want to give you a little bit of information, more information about Partnership Africa Canada. Uh, we are a non-profit, non-governmental organization uh, based here in Ottawa. Uh, we work in human development in Africa, with governance in the natural resource sector in particular. Um, we um, conducted, well we've been, as, as was said, we've been working in Africa for 30-something years with partners. And in the late 90s, our partners in West Africa and Sierra Leone in particular said, if you want to work on you know, socioeconomic development, 
and lasting peace in the region, because it was very tumultuous in West Africa at the time, you need to address the financing of these conflicts. So we have to look at diamonds. And so we did a bit of investigative research with our partners, and that piece of investigative research, which is called Where the Heart, Matter, uh, Where the Heart of the Matter Is, um, was published in late, 1900, late 1990s, and essentially laid the groundwork for the Kimberley process to regulate the trade in, in, in blood, what's known as blood diamonds. So since the late 1990s, we've been very much involved in resource governance, natural resource governance, the mineral sector in particular. So we are co-founder of the Kimberley Process for Diamonds. Uh, we are the administrative host for another NGO called Publish What You Pay, which is focused on resource uh, or revenue transparency in the extractive sector. And I'm the director of the Great Lakes Program, uh, which focuses on other minerals, most notably gold, coltan, tin, and tungsten which have found in a number of consumer goods in all over the world. Um, and so I work on resource governance related to those, to those minerals. Uh, we support a civil society coalition in the Great Lakes region to address the illegal exploitation of natural resources. Uh, we're expanding our gender programming today, which is what I'll talk about a little bit. And we are also piloting, um, essentially, we have a new program called Just Gold, and we're looking to uh, encourage the legal and clean sale of artisanal gold from the Congo in particular, right from the mine site all the way to the end user and consumer. So we're looking to create a clean legal supply chain, something similar to fair trade, uh, but unique for gold. And PAC has a, has a, 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 a reputation and I think our approach to everything we do is dialogical. We engage the private sector, civil society and governments, we bring them around the table, we do research, and we really try to find innovative solutions to really difficult problems. So we're always piloting and trying this and doing that. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we're really, I think, at the cutting edge of a lot of these issues. So just to give you a sense, when I talk about the Great Lakes of Africa, I'm referring to all of these countries, uh, in part because there's an institutional framework. There's an intergovernmental body called the International Conference on the Great Lakes Region, which is based in Burundi, and their membership uh, which is bound by a pact on peace, security, and development, brings in essentially 12 countries of Africa. So DRC, all of its immediate neighbors, plus Kenya and Sudan. So these are the countries where my program operates and where a lot of our partners are. So when I'm talking today about the Great Lakes program and the Great Lakes region of Africa, these are the countries I'm referring to. So essentially it stretches from Zambia to Sudan, Tanzania to Congo, Brazzaville, and Angola. So what are conflict minerals? I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept already. It, it harks back to the idea of blood diamonds, uh, essentially minerals and high value uh, natural resources that are used to finance conflict and armed violence uh, in the world. But conflict minerals in particular are usually used to define or to, to, to describe four minerals in particular. Tin, tungsten, tantalum, which is also known as coltan, and gold. And these have been proven to be important sources of conflict financing in DRC, but also cross-border smuggling with the neighboring countries. And gold is particularly lucrative. Uh, if you think that gold is, well, has been, is roughly about $1,300 an ounce, how easy it would be to smuggle. I mean, the three T's, tin, tungsten, tantalum, we're talking about big, you know, 50, 90 kg packets with gold you can put in your pocket, smuggle across the border and for an ounce you could get maybe you know, $1,000 to $1,300. So you can see how lucrative a trade would be, uh, but it's also equally difficult to control. There are a number of definitions applicable to what's loosely called conflict minerals. The ICGLR, so that intergovernmental body I referred to, which has a certification mechanism for these minerals. And the OECD, which has a guidance for companies on how to behave responsibly and to try to clean up the sector to make sure that they're not buying conflict minerals. The definition relates to specifically non-state armed groups and public or private security forces. So that includes government, you know, armies as well when you talk about uh, public security forces. If they're engaged in legal activities or, in, or serious human rights abuses, profit from exploitation, trade, or transport of conflict minerals in this region, it's called a conflict mineral. And there's a U.S. legislation called Dodd-Frank that would say that if you have this in your supply chain that falls in this definition, you are sourcing a conflict mineral. And serious human rights abuses include all those things that I've listed there, 
And you will see uh, under point four figure that I'll talk about today is gross human rights violations and abuses, including widespread sexual violence. So what I want to kind of unpack a little bit today, and even challenge, is a dominant advocacy narrative on conflict minerals. That the exploitation of mineral wealth, that is to say the three T's, tin, tungsten, and tantalum, and gold, by armed groups, and the purchase of dirty cell phones, uh, are causing war and widespread rape in DRC. So it's, a, it's something that's used, and we, we hear a lot, especially in the United States, but I think it's coming to Canada as well, the United States and Europe. But I'm wanting to unpack this this uh, dominant narrative a little bit, and particularly address the issue of, of linking in or, or using rape as a way to draw people into the discourse and to um, get them, urge them to take action on this issue, which is not, it's not uh, an ill intention, but it does have some consequences that is worth uh, unpacking and thinking about. So here's one of my slides with lots of words. Um, essentially, there's been so much um, negative publicity and call to action to clean up the supply chains with regards to conflict minerals in particular, that a number of initiatives uh, and regulatory and legal reforms have emerged. Chief among them, not, not the first one, but chief among them is the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. This is a US piece of legislation that was essentially intended to clean up the banking sector in the United States. Uh, but there had been so much lobbying around uh, conflict minerals and, and, and the use of the linkages to sexual violence in particular and the urgency to do something about it because it was so, you know, it, 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 it uh, you know, uh, created so much emotion in people, especially in the United States, that in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, again, this banking legislation, tucked way deep into it, they've uh, essentially included a provision that says, if you are a company sourcing minerals from the Democratic Republic of Congo, if you're sourcing tin, tungsten, tantalum, or gold, you have to, first of all, identify if it comes from Congo. So let, let's take a concrete example. If you are Apple, and all of these products are found in electronic products, aero, aero um, space engineering, medical products, uh, gold is found in textiles, it's found in all sorts of products. But the electronic companies have been particularly targeted for these campaigns because they use these three minerals and gold in all of their products. So if you are Apple, then you have to decide, this law says that you have to say, or you have to know if the mineral comes from the Congo. If the mineral comes from the Congo, you then have to show how you're doing something to clean it up. And then you essentially have to publish a report showing that you're doing something to, to clean it up. And then that report is audited. So it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, you know, you're not going to be persecuted, you're not going to be uh, prosecuted legally, you're not subject to legal prosecution or financial penalties, but it's a public disclosure uh, requirement. So you'd be more suspect to, or more susceptible to uh, naming and shaming. So this has really uh, galvanized, especially the high-end users like those electronic products, or electronic companies to do something about uh, conflict minerals. So that provision, particularly that legal provision, has really um, bit into the conflict minerals uh, uh, initiatives. It's the one that's really driven a lot of the actions in the region internationally. And it's the one also that links directly to SGBB. The International Conference on the Great Lakes Region has a certification mechanism uh, to uh, trace and report on these supply chains in the region up to the point of export. The OECD has developed a due diligence guidance for companies to essentially lay a, a process uh, approach to how to clean up the supply chain progressively over time. The EU has developed legislation to address conflict minerals. There was a conflict minerals bill that was tabled in Canada last year that, that did pass, but it uh, was tabled by Paul Durer. And then there's another initiative called the African Mining Vision, uh, and it has a center in Addis that includes cleaning up the sector, but more regulatory reform um, across all uh, mineral sectors. So this is to say, there's a tremendous effort, or tremendous efforts underway, and great pressure on governments and the private sector to improve natural resource governance and their sourcing practices, respectively, as a critical piece of the peace-building puzzle. No one is saying that you know addressing or cleaning up the supply chain is going to bring peace to an area, but it will. The idea is that it will cut a important form of conflict financing in the region. So um, women's security 
uh, is either largely absent or very late to this agenda. It's included in some of the provisions, sometimes directly, sometimes just in, in, as, a, as a larger human rights issue. But what that means for gender and how we can address gender in, in this, through this nexus uh, isn't concretely uh, addressed in any meaningful way in any of the initiatives that are resulting uh, from these regulatory legal shifts. But these regulatory and legal shifts are also creating opportunities uh, to follow up on you know, the concerns around gender and see that something uh, gets done in order to make sure that women's lives are improved uh, in mining communities in Central Africa. So there are two primary, primary discourses that uh, PAC has noticed when it comes to gender and conflict minerals. The first is this idea as, you know, we have to do something because conflict minerals is causing rape in the Congo. So here we see, especially in the United States, we have seen rape and sexual gender-based violence as a hook to draw people to, to speak to kind of their, at their emotional level, their affective level, to get them engaged in an issue, to push for regulatory reform, to push for, for companies to clean up their sector, to adopt that Dodd-Frank legislation. That was a big motivator between the adoption of that legislation in the United States. So that, that is, it, is, it a, is it a means to an end because um, it's been kind of used as a hook to draw people in, but now that all these things are adopted, that discourse still exists, but what about the women? It's still kind of just discursive. We have it in the legal framework, or the reference to it in the legal framework, but on the ground and in these initiatives, we don't actually see any meaningful engagement of what, how women participate in the sector, how they're going to be protected. So it's very limited. It's been used to draw people in and then essentially dropped. We'll say there's no follow-up. So is it, has it been just a tool, essentially, to drag people into uh, the conversation or into the debate? The second one is kind of a, it's more from the private sector side. So we want to create, this is the OECD kind of discourse. We want responsible supply chains, responsible sourcing. We want companies to do their due diligence. We refer to human rights provisions in the, and uh, sexual exploitation or, or sexual violence. But that, again, is, is only on paper. Uh, it's only in passing. And these are very kind of economistic sort of understandings of the supply chain. Communities are homogeneous. Uh, it just essentially doesn't penetrate at the local level. We don't get sense of local power dynamics and what it might mean for these initiatives once they're implemented in a top-down sort of fashion. And I have a question there in terms of where are the feminist supply chain experts, uh, which are sorely lacking because we look to integrate gender and have feminist analysis, but when it comes to supply chains, you know, there's no real expertise in terms of where are women in supply chains and how do regulatory legal reforms efforts to clean up supply chains, what are the impacts on women? Nobody's really doing this yet. So again, the implications of these efforts. Um, what we see is we have a very large community, very active vocal community working on sexual and gender-based <coughs> violence. We have a very active vocal community. When I say community, I mean not just NGOs, but you know, broad stake, uh, representation of stakeholders working on national resource governance. There's very little crossover between the two. And so when you're in the national resource sector, you're more or less like where I am, and I'm saying, you have to pay attention to gender, they'll send you to the sexual violence people um, who know nothing about natural resources because it's not their specialization. And when you're on the other side, you try to introduce natural resources, they don't see the connection or, you know, they don't want to talk to the geologists and the engineers and that sort of thing. These are very strong pillars that aren't speaking to each other, but there has to be some sort of connection. Again, going back to sexual violence as the hook, uh, reactionary approaches. Uh, do the means justify uh, the end? Uh, some of the things I've seen on the ground, for example, is that there is a perception now in some parts of Congo, some, some mines, where um, you know, there's some pressure, some perception that maybe women shouldn't be in the mine site. So if somebody like myself goes there, the women are dispersed. They're made to be essentially rendered more invisible. Now, is that a solution or is that creating a greater problem? So essentially, you know, ignoring that they're there, hiding their presence in the mine site, because there's a perception that there's international pressure to get women out of the mine site um, is, is, is itself a problem. Uh, we have, uh, again, simple and problematic statements that need to be unpacked. We have um, a focus chiefly on women as victims of violence, especially SGBV. So we really overlook them as productive economic and political actors. You're effectively excluding them. Women are present in the mine site. They're active in a number of different ways, and in the trade. 
So this is about their livelihoods. We want to make sure that their livelihoods are secure, that they're protected, but we don't want to obscure them. We want to, you know, protect them and enhance their economic opportunities. So this kind of this kind of framing as sexual violence only overlooks that because essentially they're presented as, as victims of sexual violence only. Uh, that kind of OECD econ econ economic and risk management approach when it comes to supply chains, which is focused on exports, again, communities as generic, homogeneous. Um, and if you look at it, or if you look to um, in initiatives that are have that sort of ex approach exclusively, again, uh, the solutions, especially from top down, where you ignore local community dynamics, you ignore uh, local gender dynamics, you're not familiar with them, you have a top-down approach to cleaning up the supply chain, you actually risk rendering those that are marginal, like women, possibly, even more marginalized. So the risks are there. And finally, um, there, the, 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 there's very few in the sector that want to recognize or understand how governance reform needs to give due consideration to gender. It's a very difficult pitch when you're working with, quite frankly, engineers and, and geologists and supply chain experts, again, very economists and others, why you have to look at gender and why this has to be integrated in, in this discussion. And I put up a picture there of Mar uh, uh, Margot Wallström, who's currently the Sweden's foreign uh, minister, foreign affairs minister. Uh, she talked about, actually there was an article recently in Foreign Policy, about how Sweden has adopted and is promoting a feminist foreign policy. And when they uh, announced this in the United States, there was a lot of eye rolling, there was a lot of giggling, they couldn't take it seriously. Nobody actually understands it. There's a great deal of confusion. So I think it has to be explained and done concretely so people can understand it and it can you know, be more readily acceptable. But in my sector, it's, it's kind of the same kind of reaction. There's, if you bring it up in the mining sector, the relevance of it is not understood, and there's a lot of eye rolling and giggling. You know, we have to get beyond that. So I think some of the work that I'll be talking about with my colleagues uh, Doris and Blair hopefully will create the evidence to get that sort of vibe. So what is the reality? Where are the women? Women, in fact, make up very high numbers in the sector, from 30 to 50 of the artisanal and small scale sector, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and as high as 90% in some, in some areas, or in gold in particular, we have a high concentration of women working. Uh, their roles range from digging, panning, processing, provision of goods and services, prostitutional, transactional sex, trade, all sorts of things. They are very there, but if you go to the site, you might not see them. So it, it's, it's fascinating, but it's also worried. So what is the impact of natural resource governance effort, efforts, like the ones that I've just, you know, over, uh, just presented? Do natural resource governance efforts improve women's security and livelihoods? And where are women in these resource governance efforts? They're certainly not around the table. So as these are being devised and rolled out, uh, as laws and regulations are being developed, where are these women? So artisanal and small-scale mining. And when we talk about conflict minerals, there's often a conflation with industrial mining. So we talk about you know, Canadian mining companies abroad and that sort of thing. They have an obligation, of course, to behave responsibly. But when we talk about conflict minerals, it's usually in areas where you rarely find an industrial mine. We're talking about artisanal mining, of which there's an estimated 30 million people in the world. Uh, 80 to 100 million people depend on this sector for their livelihoods. And in Congo, it's estimated, I mean, these are rough estimates, probably 3 million people depend on artisanal small-scale mining for their livelihoods. If you multiply that by five, when you consider their dependence, we're talking about a huge section of, of the population. It's often disorganized and formally organized. Um, it's subsistence, uh, but it can be small enterprise. There can be some basic tools, there can be a mill, there can be a crusher, but at a very basic level. The rights are often severely limited, often unlicensed, and in Congo, there is no land up for grabs. It's all owned by powerful individuals or companies, and so uh, access to land uh, and getting legal title is almost impossible for an artisanal miner. So they have no legal rights. They often aren't legally recognized. They're operating in extra legal or illegal ways. Uh, they're exposed to very harsh working conditions, living conditions. They're often, especially in the gold sector, they're using mercury and cyanide uh, to essentially maximize their yields and productivity. So that has all sorts of health effects. 
and their yields are usually very low and they have low income. So we're talking about, you know, the, the, the bottom of the bottom. These people are very, very poor, very vulnerable, and now we're talking about the women within those sectors. But there's clearly a research gap because we have made assumptions about, you know, that women here are raped, uh, they're, they're, they're vulnerable, and that's across the board, and all the information we have is essentially anecdotal. So there's a lack of understanding of women's everyday realities in this sector. How they participate economically, politically, how they organize themselves. Uh, what are their leverage points? Uh, what are their opportunities? You know, how do they negotiate power? We have, we have none of this information. We don't even have basic statistics. And I'm talking here about three T's and goals specifically. So we need to get deeper data um, to get questions of local power dynamics, practices of disempowerment, but also practices of empowerment. You know, they're not without uh, some, uh, you know, autonomy. And which decisions do they make? These are the type, this is the type of information we need, in part to know, you know, for these kind of interventions, are they helpful or are they harmful? So, PAC, together with the University in Kisangani, which is a university in northeastern Congo, and Catholic University in South Kivu, and an NGO in Congo called Rio, with the support of Irish aid, we did just a very first, kind of very basic, preliminary, uh, baseline research on women's participation. Their vulnerabilities, their, their opportunities, in the artisanal gold sector in particular in Eastern DRC. And then that was followed up with a number of consultations with local communities and presentations to authorities and stuff, in part to start to open the space up to talk about these things. And we found that there was huge traction. Uh, government officials, NGOs, everybody was wanting to talk about this. But the general reaction or assumption is, we've got to get women out of the mine site. And we've got to get women and their children out of the mine site. They're lumped together, but they have to get out. And our research actually proved something to the contrary of that. So it's the beginning of some very interesting uh, debate. And what we did is we partnered with those local researchers and universities and used surveys. I'd say limited participant observation. The research lasted about a month, a month and a half in two different provinces. So just to give you a sense, uh, the first research was here. So this big, massive province of Natal is the major gold-producing province of Congo. So we did a first research up here, just north of the, cap the provincial capital. And then this green province, South Kivu, uh, we did it in this area here. And this eastern Congo, of course, is the major producer of three Ts in gold. So some of the information coming out of South Kivu, so if you go back to the green province. Um, we collected some basic statistics, um, but what was also interesting was the range of activities women were involved in. This is for gold. So they're washing, they're separating large stones, they're carrying sand and stone from the site of extraction to the washing and sorting stations, they're crushing stone, buying sand to resift for gold because there's always flex and you know some particles that have been missed, so they're going over it a second time. They're selling foodstuffs and other goods near the mine site. Uh, they are prostitutes. They are traders. Uh, they are some of them a small percentage. So the, the lower you go down this, this list, the fewer there are, but they still exist. You have some who own semi-mechanical tools for hire. So they're renting out equipment. So obviously they had some capital or some cash at some point. Or they're female owners of a mine site or pit. Sometimes they're operating behind, as shadows, behind a male counterpart, either because, for whatever reason, we actually don't know, but perhaps, you know, they don't want to expose themselves as owning it, or perhaps they're, sometimes it could be uh, the wife of a politician, there's all sorts of dynamics that we're just starting to get at. And of particular interest, but not altogether surprising, women here stated that they wanted to leave the sector because it was really harsh, you know, they, they want to send their kids to school, they want better incomes, uh, it's extremely hard work conditions. So they wanted better opportunities. That wasn't altogether surprising. In Oriental, so this is the big orange province, just north of Kisangani. So this site, and this was completely unintended. Uh, we were working on this site because this is where we have one of our just gold projects, create a legal supply of artisanal gold for export. So one of these kind of like fair trade, just gold projects. So we decided to do, to integrate gender, uh, do a gender baseline assessment. So what we didn't know is that the AFM, which is essentially the, the mine boss, had decreed 
that no women or girls are going to work in the mine site. So they actually weren't allowed to work in the mine site. So this is very different from the other site that we talked about. And that was in part because they thought it was for, to protect the women from the miners, to protect them from all forms of violence. It was for their own good, so there was a bit of infantilizing there. Uh, but also because women are bad luck in the mine site. So let's keep them out and our yields will be greater. So you have this kind of uh, stereo, not stereotype, but stigma attached to women around mine sites uh, where the yields would decrease if they're there. So they effectively excluded them. So here we got basic gender statistics as well, or gender breakdown of statistics, and statistics. And the activities identified were the following. Bear in mind that they couldn't be in the mine site. So commerce was 75%. Uh, sex work, undetermined, undetermined percentage, but sometimes described as secondary activity to supplement the income. There were no diggers. There were no traders. Again, that's not surprising. But, but traders, um, partly, perhaps, uh, because Traders often go to the site to buy the gold, so they, maybe they didn't have access because they couldn't go to the site. Um, you also need a legal license to be a trader, so perhaps uh, they didn't want to expose themselves, so they didn't buy the licenses. That still has to be unpacked, but it's interesting in and of itself. Cooking and restaurant services, 15%, agriculture, 10%. So that's not altogether all that surprising. What's interesting in the gold system, or the way gold moves a supply chain, is that it's pre-financed. Meaning that if I'm a buyer in Dubai, I will advance money to my guy, and they are men, guy in my exporter in, uh, in Congo, who will then advance it to the trader, grand négociant, petit négociant, big trader, small trader, then to the mine site owner, and then he will give money to the, to the, to the miners, who will buy their day supplies and feed themselves, and then they get to keep a portion of that money, but on condition that then they sell their gold back up the chain. So essentially the gold's already bought. It's already bought before it even leaves the ground. So the gold is committed, which makes it very difficult to clean, by the way, because it's already been pre-purchased. Um, but what's been interesting about that is the women weren't allowed in the mine site in this uh, site in Oriental, but it meant that all the services they were provided to the miners, whether it be prostitution, whether it be the restaurants, the goods, the miners would come and they would essentially, as the bottom of the chain, all pre-financed, they would have spent the money already, or essentially they would default on their payments to women, because the whole system was pre-financed. So they didn't have any cash, they were advanced money, and they would blow it right away, and then the gold would be sold, and they had neither gold or cash to give to the women. So they were often you know, defaulting on their payments to women. So that presented a particular vulnerability. They also had to negotiate with the mine site administrator for access to the site. So they still had goods to sell. They had food stuff to prepare to sell to the miners. So even accessing the miners to sell these things required negotiation, whatever that involved. Uh, the key food steps, foodstuffs were first purchased from the mine boss. He had insisted that the key foodstuffs be purchased from him. So that essentially raised prices, but also possibly created some vulnerability because they had to negotiate with the mine, the mine boss because he is the authority in that region or in that, that community. The cigarettes and the cooking oil were exclusively the monopoly of the FARDC, which is the Congolese army. They're very predatory uh, and, and also uh, rendering um, the community and the women in particular quite vulnerable. Cooking oil, of course, women needed, so they would have to negotiate with the FARDC to have access to it. Um, so women were taxed essentially by both to get these things, or they had to negotiate access to these things from the mine boss and the FARDC. So you see essentially a concentration of power. And also because the women were not in the mine site, they didn't have access to gold, and gold is cash. So they had no way to break out of that system to buy elsewhere. They were essentially committed to buy from these people. Some women do participate directly in mining activities, but covertly. They assisted their husbands, but you know they were carrying water at night onto the mine site to help their husbands uh, extract the gold, but then they didn't have control directly on the, of, of the income. So again, it was access to cash was blocked. Official statistics uh, on incidents of sexual violence there are inaccurate, largely because in most cases uh, the issue is settled monetarily between families. That also applies in South Kivu. So just this preliminary analysis in Oriental suggested that just because you kick women out of the mine site, ostensibly for their own protection, doesn't mean that their lives are better. In fact, in this case, it seems that economically, their lives were, they fared worse than the ones in South Kivu, where the women were actively uh, working on the mine site. Uh, their dependency on their male counterparts is heightened. They're rendered even more economically vulnerable. 
And what was interesting here is that compared to South Kivu, everybody wanted out, the money on hell, the women wanted in, because that's where the cash was. And with cash, that's where they could start negotiating and buying from other sources for, for basic products and have more independence from their male counterparts. So it raises a question on, on analysis of all this, and this is something that I've explored with uh, Doris and Blair, was about the economies of sexual violence. Essentially, what are the conditions that are um, creating these vulnerabilities for women? Why are they sexually violent, sexually um, uh, vulnerable, and vulnerable in other ways? What are the economies driving this? Um, pretty well gone over this. The, the findings were essentially about vulnerabilities, uh, various forms of participation. One thing as well, this kind of research will help provide is at the moment, in terms of regulating the sector, formalizing the sector, if you bring more people and women into you know, the legal sphere, you make it more transparent, doesn't mean that they will, be more, they will be taxed more, absolutely. But when they're looking, for example, to secondary economies in the mining sector, the food provision, they could tax that as well. And there are uh, initiatives or uh, suggestions or efforts at the moment thinking that maybe that's the sector we should be taxing, the secondary activity that is, you know, that is a huge part of the economy, so they should go after that. Well, that's mostly populated by women. So we need to have a better understanding of where women are to make sure that they're not you know, um, overly uh, burdened by any kind of initiative like that. Uh, when they're in the sector, they want out. When they're excluded from the sector, they want in. Uh, I did talk a little bit about the sector-specific experiences of gold. Uh, and when there was evidence of sexual violence, like I said, like rape, that sort of thing is underreported. But at the same time, um, sex, transactional sex, uh, was, was recorded and was seen as, as uh, a norm, but took on very, very uh, many different forms, and was in part conditioned by the economic vulnerabilities that presented themselves. So what are the limitations of the conflict mineral sexual violence rape nexus? So uh, we need to appreciate the multiple ways in which women's active economic activities in ASM are sidelined by a dominant narrative that focuses on rape and conflict minerals. So it is obscuring and disempowering. And this here is a quote from a report called uh, Women and Natural Resources Unlocking the Peace Building Potential. It's not just the mining sector, it's across all natural resources. It's very interesting. Uh, produced by UNEP and UNDP and, and a number of other UN agencies. And in their survey or research across the natural resources sector, uh, sectors, uh, the, their um, observation is that international assistance for women in conflict-affected settings continue to focus chiefly on women as victims of violence, particularly SGBV, indirectly eschewing support for women as productive actors in recovery and peace building. And this is clearly a missed opportunity. Uh, we also have what comes out of this kind of nexus is a reductionist approach where a focus on SGBD overlooks the conditions that create or sustain security. And these, are, you know, I've mentioned some already, but it also includes access to land. There's no la land available, and when it is, it might be titled to, to a man. Uh, where legalization in a predatory state creates vulnerabilities, where for formalization may have a, more, have a gendered impact, we don't know. Uh, access to cash and credit is a, is a, is a problem and, and renders women particularly vulnerable. Where you have the military that has a monopoly over primary goods, and then larger contests over identity related power struggles. All these things beyond SGBV that condition and define uh, women's vulnerabilities. So these are the things that have to be, you know, beyond SGBV thought about. So now there's a second research phase underway, and this is in partnership with the Institute of African Studies, uh, and Doris and Blair and, and others, uh, PAC, and a research institute think tank in Uganda called DRASPAC, uh, many of whom uh, the principal researchers there uh, have links to uh, Makareli University. So now we're launching together a multi-year, three-country study on gender and artisanal mining funded by IDRC, uh, DFID, uh, which is um, uh, the UK's equivalent to SIDA. Uh, uh, and the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, it too will focus on three T's in gold, uh, in DRC, Uganda, and Rwanda. So those are the countries that are targeted, primarily targeted by international interventions to clean up the supply chains, the conflict minerals uh, uh, response. And they're also undergoing uh, sweeping reforms in the mineral sector. So what we really want to know is, is essentially where are the women in ASM, three T and gold, in these countries? 
what are they doing? How are they participating in this sector? Uh, at the mine site, along the trading chain. What are the barriers and solutions to enhancing their empowerment, economic empowerment? And then use that information essentially to contribute to you know, policy making, improvements in policy making. So, so, so the, the, as we're rolling out, or as these countries are rolling out you know, mineral sector reform policies, ensuring that there's a, a gender component to it or some considerations of gender that actually reflect our realities on the ground in those countries. Um, how does this information, how can we use it to improve conditions for women in the ASM? Partly, again, uh, improved policies that affect realities. And also, all these initiatives that are being rolled out at the top, kind of top-down level, uh, to make sure that they too take into consideration, you know, evidence and, and experiences of women on the ground, so that it's it's a more um, uh, fitting. It's a, it doesn't have negative consequences. These are the things that actually should have been done before these things were ruled out. So it's a bit, it's a bit, you know, we're a bit behind them, but it's still at a time where all these things are being discussed uh, and implementation is rolling out. So to include gender at this point is absolutely critical. And a fourth objective is, of course, to increase the research capacities of our partners. Um, they will have public publishing opportunities, research opportunities, uh, opportunities for other, um, other uh, collaborations uh, in the region and internationally. So support to local partners is, is very important. And in terms of methods, um, I'd say it's a, it's a political economy, feminist, anthropological approach. Um, and we also have a mining engineer on board, so it's very multidisciplinary. Um, but the field research is being done via surveys, life histories, participant observation uh, over essentially the first two years. How can such results be used? I think, um, you know, I've been working with the Institute of African Studies now for three, four years, and I think the combined academic NGO approach um, has been very useful, and I think here it's really coming to fruition where we see PAC has existing relationships in the Great Lakes region. We're already in policy circles. We help develop the OECD guidance. We help develop the certification mechanism at the regional, regional level. We have access to ministers and, and our partners in the region. We would like to feed the data and the evidence we collect together into these policy spheres and then roll out, essentially, implementation together. So this type of partnership is proving to be I think innovative and, and uh, we hope to have uh, an important impact that in isolation uh, we might not have. So at the policy level we hope to provide the data and evidence to demonstrate how and the extent to which women are key drivers of the ASM sector and its secondary economies. And I should add to that to convince governments of the importance and relevance of the ASM sector. Because governments in the region, and not just in the region but internationally, are very pro-industrial mining. But if a company might employ 50 people, but would have to maybe chase out, you know, 20,000. So what do we do about this sector? It too can be extremely productive. So uh, we also want to show the governments uh, the importance of the sector, the relevance of it, uh, and we want to make the economic argument because, quite frankly, that's what sells. I think it would be very interesting to calculate the cost of disempowerment of women in the sector and to show governments that why it is important for gender inclusion and why the ASM sector is important. We are offering, uh, we're beginning to offer the possibility of training government officials on gender and <coughs> in the mining sector and resource governance. And again, a baseline for analysis and monitoring of the impacts of these initiatives that I had spelled out earlier. So, you know, this is how women are living these, you know, interventions and, and this aid at the moment. What's going to happen five years from now? Maybe we can monitor that and see what kind of impact these efforts and however well intentioned, have there been negative impacts? What has been the outcome? And then uh, PAC has is in the process of securing complementary funding, and then we can talk about what we do with this information beyond policy. We can look at this kind of just gold model. How do we integrate gender um, at the local level in these in these initiatives to clean up the supply chain? Um, from these kind of local pilots and experiences of integrating gender, what can be learned and then shared with other countries so that they adopt them? Um, for certification purposes, to clean up the supply chain, there are a number of tools, a regional database, audit committees, local monitoring committees, mine site inspectors, etc. Let's integrate gender there and learn from that experience. So these are all kind of implementation opportunities uh, that we can, we can participate in or promote based on the evidence that, that we collect. 
more training, and also targeted support to authorities. You have, um, in all of these countries, actually most of Africa, you will have a gender focal point, uh, either across the government or in a particular ministry. So there is, for example, in the Ministry of Mines in Kinshasa, the Ministry of Mines in Kampala, you have a gender focal point. Well, this person is essentially operating either in isolation, he's a mining engineer, or she's a mining engineer, they might talk to the Ministry of Family and Gender, but that ministry never has any resources. So how can we help bring these people together and support them to actually roll out the things that they're actually committed to do, but really don't know how to do it, whether it be licensing or titling or training for artisanal miners or bring services locally. Uh, so how can we support those authorities, again, based on the evidence uh, that we will collect in the field? And then finally, this is my last slide, um, it's about smart advocacy. Uh, and this goes back to, you know, using rape to draw people into the conflict minerals discourse and to spur them to action and to, you know, to tap into their, their emotional effective responses. It has had a tremendous, that's been tremendously successful. But, like, it's, it's really provided impetus to the conflict minerals cleaning supply chain debate. But, possibly to the detriment um, of, of women and under, better understanding power dynamics locally and now we have these kind of top-down initiatives that kind of obscure these relations at a local level. So what can we do to change that up? How can we do smarter advocacy now to make sure that those things are considered when we're trying to affect and support change of local actors? So I would argue that smarter advocacy means unpacking and following the gender threat. So if we're saying that you know, conflict minerals uh, causes rape, well, okay, let's unpack that. Where is the evidence for that? Where are the, where are the facts? What does that mean? What do we mean exactly? Um, so follow the gender thread and see how far you go. Because if at some point it does fall apart, we need to find the information, we need to, to get information. That's, a, that's what I would argue we're doing at the moment through this project. <clears throat> what are the unintended consequences? Get informed. Do the knee-jerk reactions in the country, which is at the moment, which is largely a lot of the pressure from outside, get women out of the sector to protect them, you know, excluding them from the sector, as the case from Oriental showed, can actually have negative impacts. We don't fully understand them yet, but we get a sense that it's not as clear-cut as we think it might be. So these kind of black and white determinations, they don't, they don't fly at, at the local level. I mean, um, we need to get a more nuanced understanding of these issues. Uh, consumer demand. Uh, the consumers of these products, again, three T's in gold are found in all our electronics products. They're in the aerospace industry, medical devices, paint, textiles, the jewelry industry is particularly sensitive. We need to ask. We need to not trust. You need to ask. Demand for gender accountability. You're supposed to have a due diligence policy. You say you trace the minerals. You have to have a policy, a company policy, according to the OECD, that says you're doing your due diligence to make sure your supply chain is clean. Where's the gender accountability in that? I mean, we can ask these questions. Uh, move beyond SGBV to get women to talk about their engagement opportunities, engagements and opportunities and vulnerabilities at various points in the supply chain. And here I thought it would be interested in, interesting at some point, we're always brainstorming about what we can do. It would be great to have a conference with a couple panels where you had women representing every element of the supply chain, from my site right to my colleague at Apple, who is, you know, wanting to source responsibly. It would be great to have that picture and get a better understanding, hear from them what it's like to participate in the supply chain. Again, ask them as consumers, ask the end users to do their due diligence on their supply chains in keeping with the OECD guidance. Ask how gender factor factors into their policies and practices. Their supply chain policies, these companies, if you go to the Security Exchanges Commission under this Dodd-Frank legislation, the companies that buy these minerals are supposed to disclose their supply chain policies. Check it out, see if there's any reference to gender, I can guarantee it will be zero. Um, push for a discursive and analytical shift and make women resource governance and peace building that nexus visible. Okay? Women participating in resource governance as an element of peace building needs to be made front and center. It's completely obscured. So we got to start talking about these things. Those two pillars I talked about, I mean, not just sexual violence, but gender and, and resource governance really has to come together. Uh, and finally, encourage governments to actively support regional and African-led peace-building initiatives in the Great Lakes regions, as well as efforts to institute natural resource governance reform and to, and to ensure that these fully integrate gender. Ask how it's being done. So if the Canadian government is saying, you know, we're supporting, um, 
I don't know, we're supporting Barrett Gold, it could be industrial mining, we're supporting the African Mineral Development Center uh, for five years. What is the gender element of that? What difference is it going to make to women? So those are the questions to ask. And that's it. Thank you. So that leaves us uh, half an hour for questions and discussion. And before you ask your question, please tell uh, Joanne and all of us uh, who you are, uh, if you're a student or an academic, when, when, which uh, topic you're studying or teaching or researching. Thank you. Also, Blair is recording this. Uh, so if there is any uh, problem about your intervention being you recorded at the end, just come in and tell me. Or if I can shut it off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks so much. It was really, really, really interesting. Uh, I'm Andrea Collins. I'm, I'm a postdoc fellow in the Institute of Political Economy, and I study uh, land governance and gender. Um, so I'm really interested in, in the questions that you're asking. I think mm -hmm. this is really, really important. Um, but my question is, is about, you're talking about, you know, how these questions of gender aren't really asked. There's the eye rolling and, and, the, and the giggling. And my question for you is, you know, in doing the research and, and, you know, going to mine sites and talking to these people, and you say you're looking at gender, what is their reaction? Do they, you know, I mean, on the one side, obviously, they, they ban women be, from being there, but I, you know, do they see this as a problem, or are these questions that are being asked on the ground? Like, I'm just kind of curious about the reaction that you yeah. get when, when you undertake this research. Yeah. Should I just answer it now? Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I, I go to the mine sites for, for the general level of programming, but there are local researchers that, that do this, mm -hmm. this kind of research for, for different reasons, obviously. Um, but, but the reaction is, even if when I talk to people locally, the research talk to, the research, researchers talk, talk to the local population, or even when I talk to administrators and authorities, they want to improve women's livelihoods. That much is, that much is clear. Um, and there was a great deal of empathy towards starting to talk about this. But the, this is in Congo. The automatic reaction or response is, how do we get them out of the sector? And that's where we're saying, that's not necessarily the answer. I'm, I'm not going to say 100% yet, but certainly from what I've seen and from our preliminary research is saying is that they have to have a viable economic, you know, option and livelihood. And it's more a question of enhancing that and protecting them, better protecting them, than excluding them altogether. Um, and there isn't a lot of purchase for that. Um, it's, we need to do something, we need to do something urgently. Women and children, we need to kick them out. We need to get them out for their own well-being. And I think in part that's what the, the mine boss that I said in, the, in one of the, you know, in Antal province, the Orange province, that's in part what he intended, ostensibly for their own protection, although it also affected his yields, he thought, if they were there, because they're bad luck. But, um, so, so I think for the, for the in DRC and, and maybe a couple of the neighboring states, it's going to be more about convincing them of the, the importance that they participate in the sector. Um, so it's going to be more about strategy and approach. Uh, rather than convincing them of the value of, of having this debate. And quite frankly, I found uh, the authorities in the region much more willing to talk about this issue than the OECD, than the World Bank, than, you know, at a higher institutional level where for them it's all frameworks and governance uh, and gender is something you pepper in, right? Um, but in, in the region I thought there was a great deal of empathy, but I think we're going to diverge on, on what the solution is. And the other thing is, they don't want any research. They think, you know, the anecdotes is, is enough that they know what's best for the population. And so convincing them uh, that a three-year research project is something worth waiting for is quite difficult, actually. So that's, that's a challenge for us as researchers, to, to demonstrate the value of this kind of research. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, John, for the wonderful presentation. And I was wondering if you... Um, from the research uh, your colleagues were doing in Oriental and, and South Kivu, they have a sense of the, the history of artisanal mining in, in those areas and, and yeah. women's participation. And is yeah. it something really driven, you think, in the last 15 years of the, the both increased prices and increased demand as the electronic industry went boom, or is there a longer history? You don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yes. yes. Um, uh, I don't have so much a picture of, of from the sites and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the lessons learned from the first pilot was 
uh, clarity and working relationships with local partners because they had very different capacities. So we ended up in South Kivu with a survey. We ended up with something in Ariantel, much more like an anthropological kind of historical analysis, which was, that's why we had a lot more rich information. Um, but at a general level in Congo, artisanal mining is something that's been around forever. Uh, it's just now we're seeing essentially a boom with essentially the, the rise in commodity prices, uh, armed conflict, which essentially limits people's mobility um, and, and essentially economic opportunities are, are limited. So there's been a real essentially focus on artisanal mining. It's also clearly, especially with gold, it's something that at the end of the day, they've got cash in their pocket. You can't do that with anything you plant. You've got to wait until the rest of the season, and that's assuming that the, the situation remains stable. So they'll continue to do their agricultural work, but they will go to the mine because at the end of the day, even if they get a few ounces, not ounces, a few grams, uh, they will have cash. And you can buy food. You can, you can go to a restaurant in Oriental and pay gold. Gold is cash. So it's a real, you know, so you've had a real influx of people who were not traditional miners coming to the region and quite a bit of mobility as some mines essentially dry out and they go to others. Um, but I also know families who've been miners for four generations. So, it, you know, the two exist. How that's changed gender-wise over the years, I have no idea. And that's a fascinating question. Yeah. I'll have to bring in a historical colleagues, history colleagues to do that. I, I really I have no idea. And I don't even know if it's documented. It must be at some level with some digging. Yes? Um, hi, I'm Sarah Kessler, I think you can Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> um, I'm in the, my second year of PhD at Nipsia. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, there's a group of academics who are coming up with increasing evidence, um, more quant qualitative, obviously, um, that the, the initiatives you talk about mm -hmm. um, have had a negative impact on some miners' livelihoods and have mm -hmm. in some cases reinforced certain power dynamics and given from power to the military and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could, if you have seen this reflected in your own experience mm -hmm. um, and if it's having an effect on women, if there are mitigation measures yeah. that might be taken to protect women. Um, that's an excellent question. The, the question about uh, women in particular, um, nobody's looking at it. That, that's the problem. That's, that's one of the problems, is that you know, all this analysis and all these initiatives, nobody actually is looking at it from a gender lens. This is something we have to do. Um, with regards to the early part of your question, uh, there has to be, I think, and I'm going to speak at a very technical level because I'm very involved in these things, there's, there's a number of different initiatives, and I think from the outside, it's not very clear what the distinction is. There's traceability, there's due diligence, there's certification, there's mine site inspections, there's mine site validations. They're all very different and they have very different expectations of what the government will do, who's involved. Um, I have very um, particular concerns about, for example, uh, a traceability provider called uh, Itsuki, which is uh, essentially rolled out by the tin industry, um, which is very opaque, doesn't share its data, um, and essentially bags and tags just about anything and then rolls it out as clean. So some initiatives clearly are full of holes for me. Um, the impact may be questionable. Um, certification, for instance, has barely started because certification requires capacity building of the member state in order to do it, overseen by a number of, of checks and balances. So that's a capacity bit issue. The region and the member states may never get there, so the certification may fall apart. So. Traceability is very far advanced, certification is still developing. These are things I think it's still very premature to assess, quite frankly. I think if we were to try to roll out or to clean up, if we had a similar situation in Canada with the same resources and capacities we have, you know, it would take us years to roll this out with a tremendous amount of additional resources. Um, in Rwanda, the Ministry of Mines has had to hire 95 uh, agents for its ministry. So you get a sense of the demands it's putting on the governments. I don't think we really know in the short term. I think we'll have to we'll find out in, in the long term. I think the best we can do right now uh, is try to make things as transparent as possible. Um, there are a number of levers, and this is another advocacy point. There are a number of things that are being underutilized when it comes to advocacy. Data is supposed to be transparent. The mineral chain is supposed to be transparent. Auditors' reports are supposed to be published. ITSKI is supposed to be publishing its data. None of this is happening. These are all things that could open up the system and exactly address some of the questions that you're raising. And I think a lot of advocacy organizations or civil society are at a loss as to how to open this up and to 
at a technical le any level anyways, to get this information to really see what's going on. So it, it, we have a number of questions, a number of critics. Some of those criticisms, I think, are founded, some are not, and some are ill-informed. So I think we need a long-term view, and I think we really need some of the campaigning to focus on the opening up of the systems so that in this information, this data is made public, so we can better understand what's going on. Yeah. So on that, I don't, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but um, do you have any sense of where the reporting under Dodd-Frank is up to? And, how accessible it are those reports? Well, those reports are public. They're on the SEC's website. So there's been one round of reporting already by the companies. Um, I think they have been woefully inadequate. Um, but, uh, you know, the proponents of Dodd-Frank, including the guy who wrote it, says that, you know, give it time, in four or five years, things will become more stringent. It's a first time round, we'll see what happens. Um, some companies, I think, you know, obviously, like the ones that are and I have to commend, quite frankly, you know, Motorola and Intel and Apple and those guys who are the big companies. Um, they have really put some effort into this, and they will have the better reports. The others just kind of, a lot of them just kind of submitted whatever they can because they're legally obliged to do so. Um, so most of them, I think, are woefully inadequate. Um, but you do have some that are kind of trying to, to, to show how it should be done. Um, but they're there. They're on the website, the SEC's website. Um, and when you say the guy that wrote it, do you mean, uh, like, so who wrote whatever it is, Section 1502 or whatever it yeah. is? Yeah, he was at our, our, our workshop in June of last year, I can't remember his name. The guy that Skyped That's in. Skyped in, yeah. I mean, he did it as a team, but he was, he was he the, lead, the lead uh, writer, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Lead drafter, sorry. So I had uh, something to say, uh, I'm a historian at the Department of History here. So the one of the preconceptions, you know, that was in your title, with the, the uh, myths about what's going on. One of the things in history you see a lot, and I think that this whole business is victim of this, is this, uh, this idea of modernization. So artisanal was before, mm. and mm. industrial is now. Mm. And there's so many times when, when there is a movement towards a more industrial production, artisanal actually rises, because yeah. the it's also... So you've got these funny things in the textile industry where you had uh, spinning was industrialized, but weaving was not. So you, by industrializing spinning, they multiply the people, say, in Montreal, who were weaving at home. All of a sudden, just, you know, it went up. So instead of being, uh, being like, you know, like from weaving like this to uh, to weaving industrially. There was a bit of weaving like this and a lot of weaving like this uh -huh. because, and then it, it went down after, but it went way high up for a long, long time because the technology for weaving was not following mm -hmm. the technology for. So there are multiple examples like this and it, it makes for very funny things about uh, rural depopulation, child labor and all that. But we, we all stuck with this preconception that you go from artisanal to, uh, yeah. And it really doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's just a similar vein. Is, uh, so this, this Just Gold project that we're doing, essentially we're piloting, we're trying to, and against all odds, to kind of create a, a clean legal supply chain. Artificial mining, right from the mine site, all the way to the end user. Um, we had a first pilot. Um, and essentially what we've tried to do is, um, I went in with a, a technical group, and there's also the Artisan Gold Council, which is an NGO based at the University of uh, Victoria under Kevin Tomer, who is one of our partners and who's awesome. He went to the field with us and they did an essentially, um, uh, bear with me because I'm an anthropologist, not a, not a mining engineer, but they did a, a gran, uh, gran, grano, granometric, essentially a, a grain analysis uh, uh, and of the gold that they were extracting. And they found that they were losing 30% of their gold because their, their methods were so rudimentary. And I can show you pictures of the methods they're using, essentially, it's, it's tree bark um, in a cone shape, so it's used as a sluice, and you, you run water through it with some, some weeds, and you do that several times until you have a pot at the bottom uh, where the gold sinks to the bottom, and then you pan that out and you get your gold. So he did that analysis and demonstrated by improving the sluice and lining it with the carpet, the kind of carpet you use when you wipe your feet when you come into a room. You lined it with carpets, and that 30% was captured. You washed the mat after, and you, you got the 30%. And um, those carpets were actually high-grade carpets that we brought from BC. We didn't actually just buy them on the local market, so they last longer as well. And we said, look, you can have access to these things on condition that you sell to this guy. 
you know, and, and you allow for essentially a sales receipt, essentially introduce traceability. And we had 97% adherence. So that was, that was very interesting. Where it broke off was at the level of the trader because, I'm, I'm going to get very technical if I, if I talk too much about this, but essentially uh, the tax regime in Congo is such that there's no incentive to sell legally at that point because it's so expensive because of all the taxes, they're just going to smuggle it out anyways. That's beside the point. My, my point is we're looking at essentially introducing technical assistance to improve artisanal miners' yields as a motivation, as an incentive to offset the higher cost of selling legally so they will allow for traceability. And now we're looking at sites where we might introduce something more mechanized, a crusher, a mill, because this is an now gold that's in rock, so it's a little, a little bit harder. And the interesting thing there is historically uh, it's been demonstrated that if women were the ones who were crushing the stone, that they get displaced as soon as you bring in uh, you know, tools and something more mechanized. So part of the reason of getting the baseline data is to, make, to know where the women are to make sure that when we intervene at this level that they're not displaced or they don't lose their livelihoods or what kind of impact it's going to have on secondary production techniques, right? Because there's a whole chain of things that go into you know, extracting and, and cleaning and preparing the ore. So precisely like that, we don't know where it's going to go yet, but we need the information first, especially when it comes to gender and who owns the tools and all that sort of stuff we need before we intervene. But uh, the pressure to move very quickly on these projects because of all this legal stuff, regulatory uh, push is insane. And nobody has the patience for this type of research. You always blame the lawyers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're so easy to blame. Well, I know there, there, there seems to be growing interest not only in the advocacy, but a lot more different NGOs. I think PACT uh, is doing work on credit and, uh, and uh, different, uh, you know, other kind of just gold type of in initiatives. And how, how, how do the different organizations, how, are you, do you work together or it depends on the individuals or how, how what's the relationship with all that? Um, there's a very small group of organizations that are working on these issues okay, so at, at, a, at a technical level. A technical um, there's a lot of advocacy organizations, uh, some will come in and out of Congo and stuff. But actual implementation, there are very few of us, and we all know each other very well. Um, we sometimes have radically different views, um, but uh, and, and three T's has been three T's has been particularly contentious, I think, in my view, uh, because again, I was talking about the ITSKI, which is the tin uh, industry scheme back in TAG, which they partnered with PACT, uh, and what you see, for example, at least my interpretation, is that they want to spread that technology throughout the region, in part to control supply and demand. So there's a market incentive to, to control the sector, possibly set the price. So there's all sorts of, there's essentially a monopoly when it comes to traceability, which has just been broken by a Canadian traceability company uh, called Joe Caspite. Anyways, there's, there's a number of us working together. Um, we all know each other now for about five to seven years. Uh, but DRC in the Great Lakes region is a big place. And I would say that um, where traceability is being done well right now, or, or, or what can be certified, is probably uh, five to seven sites. So it's very small. There's a lot of traceability happening, but I would say those are the ones that are really uh, for three T's. Gold, there is nothing happening yet. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. I think coordination is improving. Um, I think in the gold sector, we're going to touch the, the, for the 3T sector, the governments were very happy to let the donors and partners come in and clean up the supply chain and, and make them essentially uh, clean up their exports to make them look good. I think for gold, they're actually going to have to take on a lot more of the responsibility, including reducing taxes, which they're not willing to do, uh, break that pre-financing that I had mentioned previously. The government has to be much more proactive. The governments of the region, they haven't necessarily been at a technical level, so that's going to be a bigger challenge. But coordination is, is an issue. but. It's not as big an issue as, as having the governments take responsibility as they should. <coughs> Does it look anything like um, the tracing of firearms? I don't know what the tracing of firearms looks like. Because uh, in the UK at the moment, there's a lot of lobby for how uh, when you produce a firearm in the UK and you sell it externally, that it should be traceable okay. because the the ones who produce it claim that they don't sell to, uh -huh. but they do. 
and uh, to be able to and so the whole what, when I read about traceability, I read away more about illegal arms mm -hmm. deal than I read mm -hmm. about. It, it's probably gold. very similar. Um, essentially, you can go everything from you know a paper-based receipt, purchase sales receipt. You take a photo of it, upload it to a computer, to uh, barcodes, to um, you know tags with with numbers you can read, uh, different types of numbers. There's all sorts of technology. Depends on how expensive you want to get as well. Um, but I think it's very much so. Like Gilles Tasbiti, this company I talked about that is introducing traceability and they're piloting for gold. Um, they've worked in the cocoa industry for 15 years. Same technology. Um, and what you're seeing, I mean, these cleaning supply chain initiatives. And the question of gender is not unique to minerals. It's, it's the trend, right? Transparency, clean supply chains, whether it's textiles, whether it's uh, you know any foodstuffs, fish. It's I just learned that down, like you know, the goose down is being traced to make sure that the geese are not fattened up for foie gras. So you can you can you, everybody's tracing everything, um, and it could be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know now. I'm raising all sorts of questions. I automatically become suspicious when everybody jumps on board. So. <laughs> Um, but it's, I think it's very much similar technologies that are adapt, adapted to different contexts. Traceability is, is never the challenge. The challenge is the processes by which you demonstrate that the entire chain is, is clean. So, um, you know, we need, um, uh, we need, you know, the sites to be pre-inspected. We need the government to be involved. They need to release the data. We need to, um, like I was saying, for gold, uh, the challenge is going to be to create an environment that doesn't encourage smuggling, you know, that the tax incentives are right, that sort of thing. So those are always the challenges. It's not the, 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 the traceability necessarily. It's the tech, that's because that's technology. That's fairly adaptable, my understanding is. Could you give us a brief example of those five or seven sites which are kind of traceable in the free teeth? I mean, where, where, did, where is the processing? Is it in, in the Asia or, or how, how does that? Um, essentially, this is one of the challenges um, with gold. Uh, there is no kind of bottleneck. For three T's, there's a bottleneck. You have about 200 smelters in the world that process three T's. So whatever gold, whatever three T's comes out of the region, it has to go through these 200. So what the electronics company has done, this, this um, what would you call it, a consortium of, of uh, electronics companies, uh, now called uh, the CFSI, the Conflict Free Smelter Initiative. Um, they uh, created a, an auditing program for companies at that bottleneck. And these companies, these smelters, have to pass an audit. Um, and so they don't have everybody on board yet, but they have a hell of a lot of, of the smelters on board. Um, and so everything that comes out of the region has to go in there. So certification traceability has to cover from the mine site to that point. And then that bottleneck is controlled by that system. And then after that, essentially, the end users like Apple or Motorola essentially trace up to that audit, which is a lot more doable than, than having to go all the way to the mine site. Um, for gold, no such thing exists. It leaves the region, it's gone. Uh, it goes to Dubai, India, China, wherever. And then maybe even comes back again because it's recycled. Um, so, and people can melt it anywhere. Like, it's fungible, right? So um, it's a very different dynamic with gold. Uh, but three T's, uh, yes, you have a bottleneck. That's actually very. But again, there, there's a leverage point for advocacy because they don't, they don't, they don't publish the audits. They don't publish enough information on what's happening at that bottleneck. So it's a very initi good initiative, but you kind of have to trust what's going on. So that's not good enough, quite frankly. But it's a start. It's a start. So, so when you do your presentation to all these dodgy people. <laughs> The people that really, you would think, uh, have an interest in carrying on all that mm -hmm. nasty stuff. Um, how do you, how do you uh, strategically talk about the betterment of working conditions of women? Um, you, is there, that's not, a your head, that's, not a, that's not a problem. I mean, everybody wants to be seen to be on board socially, right? Improving okay. the lives of women and children. Um, when you start talking about about um, removing their tax on gold, <coughs> that's that's when you start to uh, see some very heated discussions. Uh -huh. um, when it touches them in the pocket, that's when they care. So, do you talk to trade unions uh, in Canada? No, in, in uh, they don't exist in in Congo. 
That's There's no you form of organization, form of form of organization at all. Okay. These are usually kind of, yeah. There's a big, there's a big mining reform push. This is another thing to form cooperatives. It's the new, it's going to be the new law in DRC that you have to work in a cooperative. Again, what is that going to look like? Who's involved? Already, you have a rush of politicians and, and <coughs> people of influence for forming cooperatives, right? Fronts for their own kind of economic benefits. Um, but there aren't trade unions per se. And it's it's a bit it's a forced association. Yeah. Um, but there are there's nothing really organized at that level, not for artisanal mining. Okay. Yeah, very rarely. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your and for everybody for your questions and contributions.